He is, without a doubt, the greatest of all villains. He represents pure evil. He is the ultimate deceiver. He is darkness incarnate. He is Satan. The problem is, a lot of people really think he exists. Not in a metaphorical sense, but with a sincere belief that there is actually, somewhere out there, a super powerful fallen angel who became the ruler of a nether realm of pain and torture, and whom we should fear and denounce. Now how do we know this? What is the proof? And if that proof is examined, where does it lead us? The proof is here. And if you pay attention and follow in order the appearances of Satan throughout the Old and New Testaments, you might be surprised by what you learn. When the God of the Bible was making his first appearance, the situation was unique because this religion revolved around one God. Nearly all dominant religions at and before that time were polytheistic and had a council of gods or a cast of divine characters. But this new religion of Yahweh was not a total clean break from tradition. It was still highly influenced by polytheism as its early writings show. A more detailed example is in Exodus with the famous story of Moses and the ten plagues on Egypt. The final plague was the most vicious. God kills all of the firstborn children in Egypt whose house does not bear the lamb's blood on the doors. God does this by sending the destroyer, known in Hebrew as Moset. Here, Moset passes over these houses, hence the Jewish celebration of Passover. The important thing to note here is that God directly controls this assassin. In the previous entry in this series, God punished David for conducting a census. God did not personally wreak the havoc, but instead it was an entity referred to as Pestilence, an angel, Malak, and three, the angel who is bringing destruction, Malak Hamasit. Hamasit. Masit. So what we see here can be explained as a result of monotheism. When there's only one God who controls everything, does he also have to be responsible for the bad things that happen? we will slowly see these negative aspects of Yahweh be extracted and become separate entities. Knowing just a little bit about biblical history will help to better understand things. The Bible writings for these purposes can be broken into three periods. First Temple, which were writings on scrolls written before the exile to Babylon and the destruction of Solomon's Temple, i.e. before 586 BCE. Second Temple, this was from 530 to 200 BCE the intertestamental between the Old and New Testaments and the New Testament. During the first temple we have Moset, the smiting angel and a new word Satan which in Hebrew means an agent of obstruction or punishment. Though Semitic languages do not have capital letters to us this is a lowercase word. This is not the uppercase Satan that mankind will eventually come to identify with. That uppercase Satan is absent from the Old Testament but during first temple the word Satan occurs a few times, both to mean an earthly adversary and a celestial one. As for the earthly references, there are only five, and four of those occur in biblical passages associated with David or his son Solomon. For example, in 1 Samuel, David became a double agent in the Philistine army, and they eventually became suspicious of him. They said, He must not go with us into battle, or he will turn against us, become a Satan during the fighting. And when David's son Solomon became king, and God raised up against Solomon another adversary, or Satan, Rezon son of Eliada. Rezon was Israel's adversary as long as Solomon lived. Another use of this term can be found in Psalm 109. The writer there is furious with people who have slandered him, and he is wanting someone to prosecute this misdeed. And he says, Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. So whether a Satan refers to an adversary, a troublemaker, or a prosecutor, it all refers, in the lower case, to a person on earth serving as an agent of obstruction or punishment. Now the first appearance of a non-human Satan occurs in the book of Numbers in the story of Balaam and the donkey. If you haven't read it, you really need to. It is bizarre. But the gist of it is that Balaam was a prophet who angers God by taking a trip on a donkey against God's will. So God sends Malak Yahweh an angel of the Lord, who is armed with a sword. 
And Balaam doesn't notice this angel, but his donkey does. And he goes off the path and into a field. Balaam beats the donkey when he does this, and soon the angel appears and the donkey changes course again. On the third time, there's nowhere for the donkey to go, so he simply lays down and Balaam starts laying another beating to him. At this point, if a smart donkey and a sword-wielding angel weren't hard enough to believe, the donkey starts talking. What's going on, buddy? How you doing? So, yeah. The donkey and Balaam have a conversation about their past together, and Balaam comes to realize the donkey was always a good servant. The Lord opens up Balaam's eyes, and he sees the angel. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you, because your path is a reckless one before me. So as we leave First Temple, we see that a Satan can be an everyday obstacle, a troublemaker, or an accuser. But we also see the start of a transition to it being a title of one appointed by God. With the arrival of the Second Temple period, the juiciest role of Satan in the Old Testament comes in the book of Job. This is the horrible story of Job's faith being tested beyond human endurance. The story shifts between heaven and earth, but starts with a meeting of a celestial council led by God. An entity known as Hasatan, which means the Satan, appears. Modern translations simply say Satan with a capital S, and that's what I'll use here, but the original translation is the Satan, or even the accuser. Check your Bibles, most have footnotes reflecting this. So here God basically asks Hasatan to open a file on Job. Hasatan starts by saying, look, of course Job loves you. You're, you've given him everything he could ever want. Let me take these things from him and I bet you he won't like you after that. And God says, okay. do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. All right. So this terrible bet begins. But notice how Hasatan is prohibited by God from harming Job in any way. And Hasatan really starts laying it to Job. First his livestock are killed, then his stable hands, and then horribly, Job's ten children. Job then cries out in agony, but he doesn't blame God, instead he praises him. Round two starts. Hasatan returns to God in the council and he says, look, killing his family wasn't enough, you need to harm him. People really only care about themselves, so God says again, yeah, do it. Do it. Sweet. Hasatan says, and he goes back down, and he gives Job boils and poison ivy and scabies all over his body, and Job cries out to God for an explanation. Hasatan is basically gone for the rest of this terrible story until the finale in chapter 42. But here's what we know about Hasatan at this point. He comes and goes between heaven and earth. He's part of some celestial council. He does not act outside of the Lord's permission. He has limited powers. This is not the same Satan we will eventually see in the New Testament. But what we see during the second temple is Hasatan acting on behalf of God, but only one step away from being totally independent. And we get that transition between agent and independent actor at the end of second temple. As I mentioned before, the last entry in this series dealt with a story where God punished David for doing that census. Scholars generally believe that second Samuel was written around 550 BCE. This same story was retold 30 to 100 years later in the book of Chronicles. But this time, Satan himself orders the census. Not Hasatan, but Satan, capital S. According to T.J. Ray and Greg Mobley in their fabulous book, The Birth of Satan, they say the author of Chronicles is reflecting here the growing existential frustration of a monotheistic people who find it difficult to accept a God who is the author of both good and evil. For the first time in the canonical Hebrew Bible, Satan appears as a proper noun. The cosmic personality split is underway. Between the Old and New Testaments, there were a ton of discarded stories called apocalyptic literature that never made it into religious canon. These books dealt with visions of end times given to the author, usually by an angel. Here we see Satan continue to grow. In the book of Jubilees, we meet Mastama, an angel who persecutes evil. He carries out punishments for God and he tempts humans. And he requests God to permit him to have demons as his subordinates. In the second book of Enoch, we meet a rebel angel called Satanel, who is cast out of heaven and takes up arms against it. And finally, there's a book called The Life of Adam and Eve that follows the first man and woman after they were evicted from the Garden of Eden. It explains that Satan refused to bow down to man and was cast out of heaven, and he promises to always haunt and tempt the descendants of Adam. Now, this story was reworked and made part of the Quran. 
This book also helps deflect challenges by the religious because this is a historical snapshot showing the time that people began associating this new evil being, Satan, with the serpent who initially tempted Adam and Eve. Satan is not mentioned in Genesis, but a snake is, and it's called a wild animal and not a fallen angel or the prince of darkness. We also learn how snakes lost their legs and eat dust. Also, the serpent is not considered to be anything else throughout the entire Old Testament. But let's talk about Satan. By the time the New Testament appears, Satan continues his evolution. In the earliest books of the New Testament, which were the epistles written by Paul, Satan is mentioned less than seven times, and every time he plays the role of an obstructor or a hindrance to Christians. However, by the time the Gospels appear, Satan is Jesus' nemesis, and he's quite powerful. For example, both Luke and Matthew say Satan tempts Jesus with this line. To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. The four Gospels suggest that Satan rules the physical world, and it explicitly says that he commands all demons and devils. Where demonic entities rarely appeared in the Old Testament, there are nearly 568 appearances in the New Testament of some sort of demon or evil spirit. And you have to ask, did demons just suddenly appear as the New Testament was being written? Or did the Old Testament writers just not think it was important to record them? Or does this show an evolution in how these people saw the world at that time? And at the end of the New Testament, we get the best example of apocalyptic literature, Revelation. Here, Satan is a full-blown superhero villain. He appears as a dragon, a monster, and even an ancient serpent. We see all the previous incarnations of Satan appear here. Satan, Moset, Hasatan, the accuser, Mastema, Satanel. The author even loops back and says that the serpent in the Garden of Eden is Satan. Even after the biblical books were written and compiled into one source, Satan's image continued to evolve. In medieval times, we started getting many visual representations of him. He grew horns and scaly wings, and sometimes he kept his goat legs. In the 14th century, we got Dante's Inferno that showed us hell and a very bizarre Satan. A few hundred years later, we got John Milton's Paradise Lost, one of the greatest literary achievements of the Western world. The Satan we know today is largely molded from Milton, a cast-out angel, a tortured ruler of hell, Milton married classic mythology to Christianity into this poem. Satan is actually the main character of this work, and I strongly encourage everyone to give it a read. But over the next 350 years until today, Satan pretty much remained in this form. So why is it important to show Satan as a construct of religious evolution? Because a world where Satan exists is different from a world where he does not. If Satan really exists in the form that Christians claim, then so do demons, and witchcraft, and hexes, and curses, and all sorts of supernatural evil. It's probably something intelligent Christians never really think about, but should. One can follow the evolution of this character from the religious text itself, and you can see the origins in a simple descriptive word that gained personal status, and then became an agent of a god, and then started to split off from that god, and grew in power and might. And when you realize that, Things like this seem even more silly than before. Pastor, this woman here has been possessed by witchcraft. Tonight, God set her free. The devil came right out of her tonight. In the name of Jesus, say it. In the name of Jesus, say it. In the name of Jesus. You devil of witchcraft, never come back. Never come back. Never come back. I said never come back. Never come back. Come here, come here. Pick him up, come here. Pick him up, come here.